certain of you, on behalf of graduate school IARA, faculty and students, on this fourth day of the week-long celebration of 50th Convocation Program. It's indeed a privilege and pleasure for me as a biochemist to share that we have Padma Bhushan Professor Balram with us for the very prestigious Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Lecture and he's one of the brightest star of our scientific constellation. To enlighten the audience, the Lal Bahadur Shastri Lecture was instituted by IARA to pay homage to one of the illustrious sons of India, late Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri Ji, who was a personification of integrity, competence and high ideals. During his prime ministership, Shastri Ji realized the importance of agriculture in transforming the lives of poor people in this country. And his famous slogan, Jai Jawan Jai Kisan, reminds us his vision about the agriculture and its role in bringing overall prosperity of the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I take the privilege of welcoming the dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. The chairman of the function, the very respected Professor R.B. Singh Ji, former President Nas, the esteemed speaker of this session, Professor P. Balram, former director, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. I also welcome Dr. A.K. Singh, director and vice chancellor, IRA, and Dr. Reshmi, dean and joint director education, IERA. On behalf of IERA, once again, I welcome all the dignitaries for the prestigious 50th Lal Bahadur Shastri lecture. To begin with, I would like to call upon the postgraduate students to render the invocation song.
thank you for creating the serene atmosphere by this melodious prayer. As a mark of respect to the late Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri ji, I request the, request the dignitaries to kindly lighten the auspicious ceremonial lamp and pay a floral tribute to the illuminous soul of India. Thank you. Now may I now request Director Dr. A.K. Singh to kindly welcome the chairman of this session, Professor R.B. Singh Ji with a bouquet of flowers. Uh, sir, already, <laughs> okay, once again I request Director to welcome the speaker of the session, Dr. Balram, with a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> now I request Dean Ma'am to welcome the member uh, of Shastri family, Mr. Sameep Shastri, the grandson of late Lal Bahadur Shastri Ji, with a bouquet of flowers. Thank you, ma'am. Now I invite our esteemed director, Dr. A.K. Singh, to formally welcome and appraise the audience about the significance of this lecture and to introduce the esteemed chair. A very good morning to each one of you. Chairperson of today's function, Professor R.B. Singh, former director, IRI. As a matter of fact, as per program, we had uh, our Honorable Director General ICR and Secretary there, Dr. Mahapatra, to share this session. But last moment, there was a call from the minister for some important meeting, and therefore he could not uh, make it. He requested me to kindly request for Sir R.V. Singh to chair this session. Thank you, sir, for kindly agreeing in the chair. <laughs> the distinguished speaker of uh, 50th Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Lecture Dr. Padmanabhan Balram, 
former director, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, grandson of Shastriji, Samir Shastriji, the members of Board of Management and Academy Council of the Institutes, Dr. S. N. Puri, Dr. R. C. Agrawal, Deputy Director General of Craft Sciences, Dr. H. S. Gupta, former director, IRI, Professor Misra, Chairman, Agricultural Scientist Recruitment Board, Deputy Director General of Craft Science, Dr. T. R. Sarma, Dr. Kuldeep Singh, Director National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, students, all heads of the divisions, professors, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. This series of annual lecture was instituted by the Indian Agriculture Research Institute in 1968 as mark of our respect to one of the most illustrious and exemplary sons and the second Prime Minister of Independent India, late Sri Lal Bahadur Shastriji, who symbolizes simplicity of Indian life and is the epitome of our national pride. He invoked the reverential slogan, Jai Jawan, Jai Kisan, because he realized that both Jawan guarding our frontiers and Kisan in the agricultural fields helping to ensure food and security to the countrymen are fundamental to sustain an independent sovereign nation. The prestigious Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Annual Lecture have been delivered in past by very many distinguished speakers. The first lecture was delivered by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, followed by Dr. G. V. K. Rao, Professor D. T. Lakarwala, Professor J. C. H. Hanuman Rao, and Professor M. S. Swaminathan, among many others. Today's, uh, these lectures delivered earlier are a veritable mine of wisdom and information emanating from some of the best brains of the country and abroad. Today, we have the lecture to be delivered by Professor P. Balram, former director, Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore, who is an eminent scholar. And those who have read his critique in current science editorial, uh, it's a pleasure to read his writings, the way he looks at the education system, the research system, and the national perspective. To chair the session, we have Professor R.B. Singh. Uh, Professor R.B. Singh is known to this audience. He was here uh, two days back to chair the significant research finding presentation by the professors of uh, School of Crop Improvement Division. Professor Singh uh, graduated from uh, C.S. Azad University of Agriculture uh, and Technology, Kanpur. Then it was known as Pathar College. And after doing his master's, he went for PhD to North Carolina State University. And uh, after coming back, he joined in uh, Punjab Agriculture University as economic botanist, then served as CCS University Merit as professor at the age of 29 years, the youngest ever professor in the Indian history. Then he went on to become professor of genetics and plant breeding at uh, HPKVV Palampur, and after that in Banaras Hindu University in 1972 till 1979 before he took up the assignment with the Food and Agriculture Organization as Regional Plant Protection Officer in Southeast Asia based at Bangkok. And after serving almost for 10 years, more than that at FAO, he came back as Director IRI in 1995, then became Chairman ASRB. And he went back again to FAO to serve as Assistant Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization, which is a rare distinction for an Indian to have got that position. After that, he came back to India again to serve as a member of Farmers Commission. And uh, that is where he made very important recommendations, including the C2 plus 50%, raising the cost of MSP for many agricultural commodity, which has become recommendation of the, uh, the government for benefiting the farmers. He also served as the president of National Academy of Agriculture Sciences and then as Chancellor of Central Agriculture University in Imphal. Professor Singh is decorated with one of the highest civilian award, Padma Bhushan. It's indeed a great honor for us to have you, sir, in the chair, to chair this very prestigious award lecture. We welcome you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. May I now request Professor R.B. Singh Ji to introduce the eminent speaker of this session, Professor Balra.
A very good morning to you, each one of you, ladies and gentlemen. Our distinguished speaker delivering the 50th Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Lecture, Professor Balram, the director of the Institute, Professor Ashok Kumar Singh, the dean, Professor Rasmi Agrawal, Many distinguished colleagues I see here from here who have been so closely associated with the Institute, including Dr. Puri Agrawal Sahab, of course, you can see H.S. Gupta for a very long time, wonderful contribution. Ms. Raji, you have done a wonderful job in creating now some of the new positions that you have filled so quickly so wonderfully, Mr. Ali. And of course, I am so delighted to see the grandson of the greatest personality that I ever ever. Lalwadu Shastriji's Sri Samib Shastriji, T.R. Sharma, I can see Devi Ji and Kuldeep, and if I am forgetting any names, please forgive me. My dear colleagues and the distinguished staff and faculty of this great institution, dear students, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, I have the privilege of introducing one of the most distinguished personalities in sciences, none other than Professor Padmanabhan Balram, the former director of the Indian Institute of Science, Indian Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. Professor Balram obtained his bachelor's degree in science in 1967 from Ferguson College, Pune University, MSc in 69 from Indian Institute of Technology, IIT Kanpur. Sir, my institute was not very far from your institute when, where I graduated from, Patthar College, Kanpur, Chandrasekhar Azad Agriculture University. IIT Kanpur, and then in 72, he did his doctoral degree in chemistry from the Carnegie Mellon University in USA. He joined the Indian Institute of Sciences as early as in 70, 73, I think, as lecturer, and then he grew steadily contributing at all his steps to be the professor. And then finally, the director of the Institute for about 10 years, 2005-2014. And that was the golden period, the time of contributions came from there. And when we ever prepared anything in the IARI, which we wanted us to reach there, we always used the word IISC. We wanted our institute to be the same way as IISC. If you read the the book that we had prepared, I arrived towards 2020, there is a little chapter in that which says, why IRI should not be IISC? There is a question, there is a very specific topic there. And you can well imagine, at this IRI campus, sir, you are here to really see that in some way we reflect that IRI has to be and will be hopefully with the blessings of friends like you, different than what we see it. He has been uh, contributing most extensively in the field of molecular biophysics and chemical biology in a career spread over four decades. Each decade was additive. As the editor of the current science, which Ashok mentioned very clearly, from 1995 to 2013, he authored over 300 editorials. And those editorials were really the pace setters to bring symmetry and excellence in science all over the country. Even all over the world, I will say, anybody who would read them will get absolutely, absolutely convinced that science to serve humanity 
is the, is the way to go about. As a matter of fact, he has been on many go government assignments, commissions, and so on, and he has served the Science Advisory Council of the Prime Minister and the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Union Cabinet for about almost 17, 18 years. Professor Balram is a recipient of several awards and honors, including Padma Sri in 2002. And 2002 is also common with me, because 2002 I received the Padma Bhushan. <laughs> so this is something, uh, something in common. And Padma Bhushan in 2014. He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Science, Bangalore, Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, National Academy of Sciences, Allahabad, and the Academy of Sciences for the Developing World, Trieste, Italy. Ladies and gentlemen, I would not like to stand between you and the distinguished speaker. Sir, could I have the privilege of inviting you to kindly deliver the 50th Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Lecture on Chemistry, Biology, and the Unity of Nature. Thank you. It's a real privilege for me to be able to stand before you and deliver the 50th Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Lecture here at IARI. I'm most grateful to Dr. Singh and uh, Dr. Agarwal for inviting me to this, give this lecture. And it's also a special privilege for me to be able to give the lecture when Professor R.B. Singh is chairing it. When I was invited by Dr. Singh to give this lecture, my thoughts immediately went uh, to IARI. There's a great connection between IARI and my own institution, the Indian Institute of Science. Uh, in 1958, shortly after the University Grants Commission had been formed, uh, in independent India, the University Grants Commission came into being in 1956. In 1958, the UGC declared two institutions in India as deemed to be universities. That means they could now give their own degrees. And those two institutions were the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, your own institution, and my institution, the Indian Institute of Science. So there is a connection. But even more, when I was asked to give the Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial Lecture, my mind immediately went back to my youth. Because I was in college, in Ferguson College, in the years between 1964 and 1967. When I joined the college in 1964, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru had just passed away. And uh, the Prime Minister, Lal Bahadur Shastri, had taken over. 1965 uh, was a very difficult year. It was probably one of the most difficult years, I would say, in post-independence India. In fact, the period beginning from about 1962 till 1965 were very turbulent years. We'd already fought a war with China, and we were about to fight another war with Pakistan. But more, even more importantly, 1965 was probably the year in which the food shortages in India had begun to peak. This was a prelude to the Bihar famine of 1966. These were the years before the Green Revolution. And it turns out that in India, the first changes in agricultural policy were really initiated under Prime Minister Shastri's government. In fact, what fructified many years later as the Green Revolution can be traced back to all the policy changes which were made by Prime Minister Shastri's government in the years 1965. Unfortunately, Prime Minister Shastri died prematurely. And uh, as a consequence, he did not live to see the fruits 
of what his policies really uh, led to. This was the Green Revolution. But I will say only one word about the Green Revolution because I am not an agricultural scientist. I am really simply an observer of science. I'm an observer of science both in terms of policy and I'm also an observer of science as you will see in my lecture, an observer of science in an academic sense. In terms of policy, the agricultural, the Green Revolution, the agricultural revolution which happened in India in the early 1970s can, can be traced back to a remarkable combination of uh, individuals and government. It required scientific uh, leadership which was provided here from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute at that time with M.S. Swaminathan. It required bureaucratic leadership which was provided by B. Shivaraman whose name I noticed was one of the persons who delivered this lecture many many years ago and it required political leadership which came under the then Agriculture Minister C. Subramanian. It is this remarkable triumvirate of individuals who really contributed to making sure that government policy and farmers together could move to bring about the Green Revolution. Such a confluence of people has not happened, I believe, in the years since. And which is why many policy interventions have not actually yielded the same kind of, of results in the area of agriculture. But today, I'm going to talk about something completely academic. And the reason I'm going to talk about some completely academic is I am, by practice, a completely academic scientist. And what do academic scientists who have been trained in chemistry and biology, what do they turn to when they become old? They should actually turn to it when they are young, but when they turn old, they immediately begin to think about questions of biology, questions of nature. And one of the questions one of the central questions in biology really is how did life evolve on earth? How did, what was the combination of circumstances which led to all the chemistry, all the biochemistry that we see today? This is not my first slide. I didn't make this slide. This slide was made uh, by Professor Vishwanathan who put it up because he felt that the title of the lecture should be there. I never put the title of my lecture on the slide so that I can keep the audience actually guessing. But my first slide is really Darwin. And what Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species is something beautiful. He said that in his view of life, in his view of the origin of diversity in biology, he said there is grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed by the creator into a few forms or into one. And that while this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. In this morning, I was taken to see your integrated uh, farm. And when I went and saw the integrated farm, there were ducks there, there were cows there, uh, there were various crops there, there was a medicinal plant garden and there were even some horticulture uh, in the corner. The result is biology is evident there in all its wonders and when one looks at it one must wonder how did this all come about. Now the evolution of Darwin's ideas were really on the origin of species, speciation and diversification in biology or how are all living forms in one way or the other related to one another. He really did not think very much about the origin of life itself. What was the original life form on earth? What was the first cell which actually appeared on earth? But he did write a little bit. In March of 1863, he said it is mere rubbish thinking at present of the origin of life. One might as well think of the origin of matter. Now who thinks about the origin of matter? The origin of matter is a subject which is thought about by physicists. Who thinks about the origin of life? It is a matter that is sometimes thought about by chemists because chemi matter must come first, chemicals must appear, and only then can life evolve. But Darwin in 1871 again wrote to his friend uh, Joseph Dalton Hooker 
And he said that the first production of a living being are now present, which could ha ever have been present. Then he asked this, but if, and oh, what a big if, we could conceive in some warm little pond with all sorts of ammonia and phosphoric salts, light heat electricity present, that a protein compound was chemically formed. And this was his thinking about the origin of life. Today I saw the pond which was there in which the ducks are now uh, are, are wandering around. And that pond, of course, provides the remarkable nutrients which are now necessary for whatever is growing in the adjacent plot of land. So one can now begin to think in an integrated way about the origin of life. And in thinking about the origin of life, we have to turn to a little bit of physics, a little bit of chemistry, and eventually, of course, to a little bit of biology. What are the origins of biochemistry? There is no life without biochemistry. And this is something that we must all accept. The second thing that we must accept is that there is nothing in our world which is not a chemical. So you cannot do without chemistry. There is chemistry all around you. Everything is made of matter. Matter is made up of atoms. So everything is chemical. And uh, biochemistry's origins can be traced back to cell free fermentation the experiment which was done by Edward Buchner over 125 years ago. And that experiment really is the starting point of biochemistry where he showed that a cell-free yeast extract could perform fermentation. It was the starting point of an industry. But then, of course, this is also the starting point of biochemistry because it was realized that the cell extracts contained all the necessary enzymes and other components which were necessary to do things that living matter was capable of. Of course, Buchner's discoveries were not always thought of positively at that time. His own supervisor, Adolf von Bayer, who was an organic chemist and a very precise organic chemist, he said this will bring Buchner fame even though he has no chemical talent. Because in those days, chemists were interested in dealing with pure molecules, in characterizing them, and doing good reactions. And here was Buchner grinding up cells, uh, removing everything, having an uncharacterized extract, which was now able to carry out fermentation. But if that is the starting point of chemistry, what ho of biochemistry, what's, what holds chemistry up? What holds chemistry up, really, is Mendeleev's periodic table. And you might now ask the question, which are the elements necessary for life? There are not more than 20 elements. And it's only about 20 elements of this 100-odd elements in the periodic table which are necessary for life. I show you only a part of the table, because otherwise the slide becomes uh, uh, very cumbersome. And the most important elements here I have now marked in light green, from hydrogen there, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. These are mostly the elements which are used. Some of the others, of course, are also used uh, in biochemistry. Mendeleev's periodic table is something that one might think about a little bit, because last year was declared by UNESCO as the year of the periodic table, because we celebrated 150 years of Mendeleev's periodic table. And uh, they, this is now a grand synthesis which Mendeleev did. He took whatever was known in chemistry at that time, the elements, and arranged them according to their properties. And having arranged them according to their properties, he got this table in which they were empty spaces. So the original periodic table had this remarkable predictive power. He told you that you could now search for the new elements. And that is how, in the latter half of the 19th century, so many elements were discovered all the way till the first few decades of the 20th century. Mendeleev's periodic table is one of the grand generalizations of science. Chemistry rests on it. The other grand generalization of science, really, is Darwin's ideas of natural selection after having simply observed nature. Observation and classification are central to the development of chemistry and biology. But then we can ask, where, did these, where do these elements come from? And here I cannot go 
very much into the details here, but I will just quote here Jacob Bronowski. Those of you who are young, who have not heard of Jacob Bronowski, should today go and put his name into Google, and immediately you will find The Ascent of Man crop up. The Ascent of Man is a BBC documentary which appeared in 1973. There has been no better exposition of science in the decades that have followed. This tells you of man's origins right from the beginning and how the ascent of man at each stage of human development is actually carried out by invention. Inventions which have taken place because of man's increasing intellectual evolution. He says here, in all the stars there are going on processes which build up the atoms one by one into more complex structure. Matter itself evolved. Every element has come from the stars. Every element that we derive has come from the sun, our own star. He says, the word comes from Darwin and biology, but it is the word that changed physics in my lifetime. He also goes on to add, carbon, for instance, is formed in a star whenever three helium nuclei collide at one spot within less than one millionth of a millionth of a second. Every carbon atom in every living creature has been formed by such a wildly improbable collision. It's a three-body collision. The beryllium, which is first formed when, two, carbon a when uh, two helium atoms collide, is very transient, and it has to collide with the third one in order to form carbon. And therefore, every carbon atom in your bodies is the result of such a wildly improbable event. Therefore, we must also ask the question, is life itself a wildly improbable event? And it is. Because if you look at the universe, you do not know whether there is life everywhere. We are so concerned every day with the mundane matters of daily existence that we rarely ask this question. But this is a question which must occupy our imagination. But when one discusses biology, we must remember that there is nothing in biology that you can understand except in the light of evolution. And this is, of course, paraphrasing something that the famous evolutionist Dobzhansky said many years ago. He also said something. Does the evolutionary doctrine clash with religious faith? Because in, in Christian countries, religious doctrine has often clashed with, ev with Darwinian evolution. But he says, no, it does not. It is a blunder to mistake the holy scriptures for elementary textbook of astronomy, geology, biology, and anthropology. Only if symbols are construed to mean what they are not intended to mean can there arise imaginary, insoluble conflicts. Even in our own country, sometimes, periodically, questions have been raised about Darwinian evolution. But it turns out that Darwinian evolution doesn't clash with anything that you might believe. Darwinian evolution simply is nature in action. And nature in action is nothing but physics, chemistry, and biology in action. Why is it, do I talk about chemistry so much? Partly because chemistry is the subject in which I was trained. Biology is the subject that I practiced. And Arthur Kornberg, the man who discovered DNA polymerase and fired, I believe, the first shot of the molecular biology and biotechnology revolution said it wonderfully. He said, chemistry is the lingua franca of the medical and biological sciences. Today, you should not be a doctor if you do not have a sufficient background in chemistry and biochemistry, because then, of course, you're likely to prescribe all the wrong medicines. But I would go on to go one step further, because I am giving this lecture in an audience of uh, people steeped in agriculture which is also the lingua franca of the agricultural sciences. But, but the biological sciences in general subsume both the medical and agricultural sciences. In the year 2000, the millennium, the century was ending, the old millennium was ending, and the new century and the new millennium were about to begin. And therefore, the journal Nature commissioned a series of essays on asking important people what the most important scientific advance of the 20th century really was. I was at that time the editor of Current Science, 
and I would have to write an editorial every fortnight, and I was always looking for topics. So I would read these essays with great interest. And it turned out that of all the essays that I read, only one remains in my memory. And that is this essay which said that the most important scientific advance of the 20th century was the Haber-Bosch synthesis of ammonia. Those of you who have studied chemistry will realize, and I studied it and I hated it at that time, the Haber-Bosch synthesis of ammonia involves the combination of two recalcitrant gases, nitrogen and hydrogen, under high pressure, high temperature, with a strange metal catalyst to produce ammonia. It was the first the industrial synthesis of ammonia is what Waxler Smill said is the detonator of the population explosion. And he says the world might be better off without Microsoft and CNN. And this is 2000. If it was 2020, he might have written that it might be better off without Amazon and Google. And neither nuclear reactors nor space shuttles are critical to human well-being. But the world's population would not have grown from 1.6 billion to today's 6 billion without the Harbour Bosch process. Since he wrote this, of course, the world population has grown well past 7 billion now. But this, of course, is the Harbour Bosch process. Of course, biology does this much better when it fixes nitrogen with an enzyme. But interestingly, nitrogenase has these wonderful elements in it, iron and molybdenum. And increasingly, as we learn more and more about nature's strange biochemistry, we now find that there are enzymes which contain nickel. There are even enzymes which contain tungsten. So nature has used whatever metals are in fact present in the Earth's crust. That was chemistry's first contribution to agriculture. So the first agricultural revolution of the 20th century was driven by the industrial synthesis of ammonia and the consequent industrial synthesis of urea as fertilizer. The second great contribution of chemistry, and this is a mixed contribution of chemistry, is the invention of DDT. DDT was found by Paul Miller to be extremely effective against many kinds of insects, most importantly against uh, mosquitoes, and against, in the Second World War, against typhus. So you found the louse which, create, which caused typhus would also be killed. And at that time, typhus was something very, very important. DDT went in really after the Second World War. Until the mid-60s, it was very widely used. It was still used in India long after. But in the United States, this book appeared, Silent Spring, written by Rachel Carson, in 1962. Carson was a marine biologist and she was an observer of nature and she found that the spraying of DDT had detrimental effects on many many uh, creatures which were there in the environment and therefore she asked this, we are rightly appalled by the genetic effects of radiation because this is what happened after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. How then can we so be indifferent to the same effect in chemicals that we disseminate wildly in our environment? And this is the beginning of the environmental movement. Today, of course, the environmental movement all over the world, including India, is very strong. But this is why one worries about insecticides. But I mentioned a few subjects, but I just want to show you one slide because this is the subject in which I'm actually interested in now when I work in my post-retirement phase at the National Center for Biological Sciences, and this is the subject of chemical ecology. Sometimes in science, new disciplines arise, and they arise, as Tom Eisner put it so well, they arise as a partnership, you know, by a convergence of interest. And chemical ecology is a partnership between biologists, field ecologists, and natural products chemists. Why has the subject evolved? Because if you want to ask the question, how do plants interact with their environment? Their environment has insects, and plants in interact with insects, plants interact with microorganisms. And all these interactions which take place are exclusively by means of chemicals. So it is chemistry which dominates the environment. It is only human beings where chemistry is somewhat less important. Although you will find that uh, when Prime Minister Modi hugs President Trump, for example, and he will undoubtedly do it again, 
you would say that the chemistry is very good. <laughs> so we have an intuitive feeling for chemistry. We also have an intuitive feeling in science for mathematics and arithmetic, because after every election, when there's a coalition government is formed, we will say that the mathematics is right, but the chemistry is not, and the government will fall apart after some time. But we don't really have uh, much of a feeling for the connections between these disciplines. Biology and chemistry are very intimately connected here by means of all the chemical communication that happens in uh, biology. There is a great deal of chemical communication which happens internally uh, by means of the endocrine system by, uh, and by means of the neuroendocrine system. But between human beings, the chemistry is very rarely by uh, chemical communication, but with every other living creature, it is exclusively by means of either volatile chemicals or diffusible chemicals. But what about biochemistry? At the turn of the millennium, I, I read this essay. This was by the famous molecular biologist Sidney Brenner. And Brenner wrote, I once made the remark that two things disappeared in 1990. One was communism, the other was biochemistry and that only one of these should be allowed to come back. He then goes on to say why only biochemistry should come back and it's never really disappeared. But I think uh, it's quite possible that communism might also come back because everything happens in cycles in human existence. And uh, he says we do not have to resurrect biochemistry. It will flourish because it provides the only experimental basis for causal understanding of biological mechanisms. Has biochemistry done anything for agriculture? And if you look at what biochemistry might have done for agriculture, I told you what chemistry has done. And I should tell you one story which I've forgotten. Uh, Muller, who got the Nobel Prize for uh, DDT, uh, died shortly there uh, after Rachel Carson's book came out. But after Rachel Carson's book came out, there were many, many analysts, uh, commentators, who said that the Nobel Committee made a great mistake in giving the prize for DDT to Miller because DDT is such a terrible chemical. But of course, that was not known when Miller got the Nobel Prize, and it saved a lot of people, including from typhus. But Haber, who actually got the Nobel Prize first, uh, Karl Bosch got it many years later, Haber got the Nobel Prize for his ammonia synthesis. But Haber was also the man who introduced chemical warfare. He is the man who supervised the release of chlorine into the battlefield of Yapres in Belgium in 1915, which killed thousands of Allied troops at that time, the first example of chemical warfare. But in the years between the First World War and the Second World War, Haber also did things with a great deal of cyanide chemistry, which allowed the production of a material of a tablet called Zyklon B. Zyklon B was what was put in the gas chambers in the concentration camps of the Nazis, which produced hydrogen cyanide. And hydrogen cyanide was then used to kill people. So in one way, chemistry and science in general, this is true of physics, this is true of biology, in one way, Science is a double-edged sword, and Haber's career is one which I think everybody should read because Haber's career really tells you something about the ethical dilemmas in, with which scientists view scientific advances. Einstein had a great problem with the atomic bomb. Haber did not quite recognize what he had done, but in later years, his own family went to the gas chambers with the uh, invention of uh, production of hydrogen cyanide. But biochemistry's Nobel Prize in 1945 was actually given for, an agri for agricultural and nutritional chemistry. Wettinen is probably forgotten. I do not know how many hear his name in uh, courses which are conducted for MSc students. But when you look at this conservation of fodder in the form of silage, this was done by Wettinen in Finland. And this was done because it was important in Finland because you need to preserve the fodder through the long Scandinavian winters. And if you want to do this, you have to prevent fermentation from happening. And if you do this, you need to check the growth of uh, undesirable organisms and increase the growth 
of lactic acid producing bacteria and you can do this very simply. The kind of chemicals he used were common salt, sodium metabisulfite, acetic acid. At the beginning he used just inorganic acids. So there's a lot of chemistry here in this kind of thinking. But then, to summarize what I've said so far, there are three pillars of modern biology. And these three pillars are genetics, chemistry, and evolution. Genetics, as exemplified by Mendel's recognition on the transmission of hereditary characteristics generation to generation. Evolution, because Darwin introduced the idea of variation and selection. But what connects Darwin and Mendel? What connects Darwin and Mendel really is Oswald Avery's identification of DNA as a genetic material. Avery never received the Nobel Prize, but if Avery hadn't recognized DNA as a genetic material, it is unlikely that Watson and Crick would have spent so much time trying to determine the structure of DNA, which inevitably led to the double helix. But I will show you just one more slide as a digression. Today, if you ask anybody, any policymaker, what are the two technologies on which we should spend money, they will tell you one is biotechnology, the other is information technology. My own state of Karnataka has a ministry of information technology and biotechnology. But what we don't recognize often is both the technologies of our age have a common origin. Claude Shannon, who really is the founding father of information technology, who wrote a famous paper in science in 1948 on information and entropy, and really fired the first shot, and Avery, who discovered DNA. Both of them worked around the same time in the 1940s. But interestingly, Shannon's PhD dissertation is an algebra for theoretical genetics. And today, after information technology has boomed to the extent it has, I think one of the major advances or major applications of information technology is in biology where the genomics revolution results in our now having millions and millions of sequences. And in order to analyze this, we need cutting edge computer science and information technology. But look at biochemistry. This is a chart which used to be, there are two charts which you will find. All chemistry labs have Mendeleev periodic table, nobody looks at it. And all biochemistry labs have the metabolic chartway, which looks sometimes like the Delhi or Bangalore roadmap. <laughs> with, uh, and you always wonder how biochemistry avoids traffic jams. And uh, biochemistry somehow manages to avoid traffic jams, except in the case of disease where an unfavorable or toxic metabolite begins to accumulate. Otherwise, metabolites which are formed in one reaction smoothly go into other reactions. But this is from a very recent review in chemical reviews. This is a picture of what are the central elements of biochemistry. Here you might recognize it, the mitochondrion. And the mitochondrion in a eukaryotic cell is really where the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation really take place. Glycolysis feeds into it. And here you see all of energy metabolism encapsulated into three major metabolic pathways. One point that I would like to emphasize here, that for the evolution of life and for the differentiation of cells and for the evolution of eukaryotic life and complex organisms, there is only one quantity which one must keep in mind, and that is energy. Because you need energy to grow. And if you need energy to grow, where will this energy really come from? But biochemistry is complicated. Biochemistry is complicated, and I picked this example because then all of you will be familiar with this. Now, if you take the major constituent uh, capsaicin of the red pepper, you will find that in order to make this molecule, to do a biosynthetic process, you need so many steps. Now, I have been a teacher all my life, and now I find there are two ways of teaching uh, this. If I were in an organic chemistry department, I would have only these chemical structures. And if I were in a biochemistry department, I would leave out all these structures and only concentrate on all the enzymes that I have written as catalysts across the arrows. But really, organic chemistry and biochemistry are one and the same thing. Biochemistry is more complex organic chemistry. 
and uh, this is what you need. So for every step you need an enzyme. And if you count the number of steps, you will see a large number of steps. But for every enzyme you need a gene. And therefore you need a gene, that means you need nucleic acid. The result is that to go in a biosynthetic or an anabolic process, where you're making something, you need to go from substrate to product, you need an enzyme and you need a gene, and to make one simple molecule, like capsaicin, you need a whole lot of genes in order to do this, so you're expending a huge amount of energy. Francis Crick said this very well, and I put this slide only for one reason. When I talk about this in my own surroundings, none of my molecular biology colleagues will look at you if you use the word biochemistry. But then if you quote the high priest of molecular biology, Francis Crick, they will then keep quiet. And then he says, there seems once the central and unique role of proteins is admitted, there seems little point in genes doing anything else but protein synthesis. And that's what genes do. Much of the genome is there in order to produce uh, uh, proteins. A small part of it is there to produce the ribonucleic acids. Today, of course, even for eukaryotic organisms, there are a large number of genomes which have been completely determined. At present, there are seven, this is a fairly recent uh, amount, 789 eukaryotic genomes which are completely available now. And then you can see you can build trees. And this is, of course, a picture of the Human Genome Project announcement in 2000, 20 years ago, where you find President Clinton. And this was important enough to be announced with the president in the middle. Uh, the reason is, of course, the next day the newspaper said, the book of life has been revealed. Now, we've been reading the book of life for the last 20 years. And you might ask genomic scientists, uh, what have they understood? And you will find they've understood relatively little in 20 years of reading this. Because the book is far more complicated than we actually imagined. But it does tell us some things. It tells us a few things here. Here, for example, you can see how genomes are related. Here's the human being, and here's the chimpanzee. And not too far away, there's the rat and the mouse. And then you can see the pig and the cow and the sheep, all of them are here. So now biology is telling us something. It's telling us that there isn't a great deal of difference between us and the chimpanzee, and there isn't a great deal of difference between us and the mouse, and there isn't a great deal of difference between the pig and the cow. And I would leave you to think about what this kind of unity is really uh, telling you. But today you can see genome size versus protein count. This is a wonderful site, and students should look at this. The young man who's done this has put this up so that it's online being uh, updated every day. So you can see this graph changing in real time if you sit in front of your computer and watch, but it's uh, difficult to make out. These now, all the green ones now, are the viral genomes, and with all this interest in coronaviruses, you will see that a very large number of viral genomes are known because they're very small. But as you go up, you will find you have now uh, eukaryotic genomes, and then you will have archaeal genomes. But one